because she sees Neverwinter as a new hope for cooperation and progress, uh, all the races living in harmony, as opened Miss Draner was first intended to be so long ago, you know, back in the late 200s DR when Elminster visited. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like everyone watching to take a quick moment and pause the video if you have to and make an honest list of what you think the three most well-known locations in all of the Forgotten Realms are and leave them in the comment section below. Got it? Right on. So I would venture to guess that a sizable number of folks would say one, Waterdeep, two, Baldur's Gate, and three, Neverwinter. Whether you were introduced to the Jewel of the North through the Dritz novels or the wildly successful series of video games, or more recently the D&D movie Honor Among Thieves, or myriad other ways, Neverwinter has left a lasting impression on so many fans of D&D in the Forgotten Realms. In this episode of Realms Lore, we talk all about this incredible city, and Ed Greenwood himself shares three never-revealed secrets about what Volo called the most cosmopolitan and civilized city in all of Faerun. If you want exclusive access to tons more Realms Lore secrets like this, consider supporting Ed at patreon.com slash edgreenwood, where the Realms Lore freely flows. Also, be sure to check out Ed's shop, where we're always working on great new designs. Link in the description. Folk who aren't in Neverwinter think of Neverwinter as an important port city in the Sword Coast North that's unseasonably warm for its northerly location, thanks to the volcanically warmed waters of the Neverwinter River, or the River Nethler to the dwarves, that flows from Mount Hotenau through the city to the sea. They likely think of Neverwinter as a city dominated by the tall, gleaming stone towers of Castle Never, which just soars up right on the edge of the sea. So if you're approaching Neverwinter from the sea on a, on a ship. It's the landmark you see first. This huge, high, soaring castle. It's beautiful. Now, in recent years, they have probably heard that Neverwinter got split by a terrible chasm. It split the city in two, and they may not know much more about it, because for a long time, the kings of Neverwinter forbade the publication of any maps of the city. And then, much more recently, the chasm and the rebuilding of the ruined city that followed the closing in of the chasm made big changes to the city's layout. Stepping back from the realms for a moment into our real world, this is one of the reasons Neverwinter was chosen in the first place for a successful series of computer games, and Neverwinter Nights became not just the name of a broadsheet or newspaper published in the city in my home realms campaign, but it became the name of video games from Bioware and Obsidian. Now, back to the realms. Someone from elsewhere along the Sword Coast, or even in the distant heartlands, might know Neverwinter for things from there that they or their neighbors have bought. Water clocks is a big one. Or hanging indoor lamps that are small sculptures and that feature planes of multi-hued glass and fine jewelry. And they will have heard that in Neverwinter, you can get green growing plants or fresh flowers even in the howling depths of an icy winter. Now, if you talk with someone about the politics of Neverwinter, um, they will speak of it being in the Lord's Alliance and consistently siding with Waterdeep within that alliance, and they will talk about it being very like Waterdeep in being a tolerant, open crossroads trading city, and that lots of outsiders take an interest in Neverwinter. And they've probably heard of a charismatic politician named Dagult Neverember, who for a time was Lord Protector of Neverwinter and the open Lord of Waterdeep, though his power is confined to Neverwinter now. And of course, back to the real world again, Neverwinter now has a role in the movie Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. So, Neverwinter is certainly a happening place. Would you mind telling us a little bit maybe about the significance of Dagold Neverember? I feel like a lot of folks will have been introduced to him not only from Waterdeep Dragon Heist, but also possibly from the movie and from the video game series. And I feel like he's played a pretty significant part in the developing lore of Neverwinter, and I was wondering if you might have some insight as to who he is as a person and, and why he played such a pivotal role. Dagult Neverwinter is that rarest of things 
a successful politician, meaning he's a very good con man. And one of the reasons he's very good is that he believes in what he's doing, and he does good things. But he's an end-justifies-the-means sort of guy, which means if you stand in his way, he may trample you. And that was one of the ongoing arguments in real-world politics. It's not what you do. It's how you do it. Hey, I ended up with a perfect society. Who cares how many people I had to slaughter, maim, and torture to get there? Just forget about them. You know, see, so it's all in how you think of it. Now, Dagalt Never Ember is not that sort of tyrant. The problem with Dagalt Never Never Ember is he is a con man. He sees nothing wrong with enriching himself by doing good. And he is still on the scene. He's an endlessly fascinating figure. If you see the D&D movie, you will see him albeit briefly, and he remains a player. Okay, and another thing that you mentioned about Never Ember, one of its defining characteristics, is that, that great chasm in the middle that split Neverwinter. Would you mind going into a little bit more detail about maybe how that came about and the impact that it's had on the culture of Neverwinter? Oh, dear. Um, that's a loaded question. Because <laughs> everybody argues about how it came about. Um, were there devils involved? Was Asmodeus involved? Or was the Abolephic sovereignty involved? Or maybe they just think an evil wizard did it. Or maybe the gods did it because they were angry at Neverwinter. All we know is it split the city in two. It was briefly uh, uh, this sort of smoking rift that adventurers who were crazy enough to do so would go down and try and explore. And then it later got fixed and patched up and went away. And isn't that marvelous? The amount of damage done by the chasm and by what happened afterwards means the whole city pretty much was rebuilt. Its layout completely changed. Everybody knows that the chasm was sort of down the center somewhere, mm -hmm. but you can't see any evidence of it now because they've rebuilt the entire city. And sure enough, if you see Neverwinter in the movie, there's no sign of a chasm. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about what Neverwinter might look and feel like to somebody who is on the outside. I was wondering, what are the significant differences between that and somebody from the inside? How might somebody who's very familiar with Neverwinter view it differently? In Neverwinter, it's a city of trade that produces things. Crafters of Neverwinter have long been in the forefront of developing new methods of casting so they can mass produce gorgeous, beautiful, and functional castings. The developed skills of the hundreds of crafters, they are the skilled hands in the phrase that's applied to Neverwinter, the city of skilled hands. This makes it a logical center for the production of precision items, like measuring scales for merchants who are trading. Uh, in many city in the, is in the realms, dwarves are the foremost smiths, Gnomes are the foremost casters and fine work artisans, and halflings dominate the weaving and the handiwork trades. But in Neverwinter, everybody gets involved in everything. And as a result, you have a skilled, sophisticated, literate citizenry that are good with their hands, and they understand how things work and how things are made. They think they know how the world works. <laughs> so... A given citizen of Never, a uh, Neverin, just a, a, a somebody who's a nobody and nothing special, they will have a strong work ethic. They'll be good at, with their hands. They'll have personal hobbies and maybe a side hustle, making or selling or trading in something different than their day job. So that's what it's like to live in Neverwinter. Sir Greenwood, I've been told, uh -oh. I've been told that you might be uh, gracing us with some never-before-revealed secrets of Neverwinter on this particular episode. Is that something that you're willing to confirm? I have three secrets of Neverwinter. Number one, there are more than a dozen kin of the Never Ember family living quietly in Neverwinter, working as crafters and traders, and they're keeping away from Dagult Never Ember's attention. But, although he may not be aware of them, they all know their places in the family genealogies. So let me give you three samples. Wylandra Blathlope. Okay, she sells these, makes and sells slab bread in her shop, Blathlope breads. 
uh, can we on spell Himmer these? Lane. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let's start with Wylandra. W-Y-L-A-N-D-R-A. Wylandra. Great. Blaithloak. B-L-A-Y-T-H-L-O-A-K. Blaithloak. Whew, that's a good one. Uh, on Himmer Lane, H-I-M-M-E-R, Himmer Lane, at the eastern edge of the Protector's Enclave, which is the central core, central business district of the rebuilt Neverwinter, right where it meets the River District, also known as the Towers District, which is the northeastern part of the city. Wylandra's husband, Belerak, B-E-L-A-E-R-A-K, Belerak, died recently, but she has six grown children who live with her and work in her shop. Okay, so that's one set. Whew. Now, there's somebody else who's a little more deployable to Dungeon Masters, so listen up. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the adventurer, guide to the Savage North, and caravan trader, Unser Roravan, U-N-S-R-A, Last name, R-O-R-I-V-A-N. Roravan, a tangle-haired, foul-mouthed, hard-drinking, striding bundle of energy who plays an uncouth bumpkin, but is one of the shrewdest judges of folk and well-informed, notice-everything individuals you will meet anywhere. She has the knack of staying alive in perilous situations, and it's rumored she does so with the aid of inherited family magic items. She seems more interested in being a part of exciting events than in making lots of coin or winning any real power. And Utsra is probably in her 30s, okay? She likes to act and behave as if she's younger and more energetic. Then then our, our third uh, Never Ember relation is Rundrago Black Serpent. So, Black Serpent, one word, compound. Rundrago, R-U-N-D-R-I-G-O, Rundrago which is a name borne by many unfortunate men. I mean, uh, lucky <laughs> men across the earth. Uh, so this one is a trader, uh, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E if we're spelling things. Uh, Wise uh, ass. A trader, <laughs> yeah. Uh, trader, investor, and master caster who's hard at work on making portable, wearable water clocks. Portable, wearable water clocks thus far without success. Uh, Rundigo is rich, and there are at least six Black Serpent-owned merchant ships plying the Sword Coast, though Rundigo prefers to keep the Black Serpent name off them and off the cargo contracts that their captains sign. So, that's secret number one. And here's secret number two! <laughs> <laughs> so, the scribe and translator, Mirthra Many Tongues Alarin, Mirthra. Alarian. Uh, and that's M-U-R-T-H-R-A. Many tongues is just a portmanteau word. Many tongues. That's her nickname. And Alarin, A-L-A-E-R-I-N. Alarin, of the House of Tongues on Wendair Street. And Wendair Street is W-A-N-D-A-E-R. Wendair Street in the River District, who for modest fees translates written languages or takes dictation from you to take your words. Uh, say something polite to him. Sure. <laughs> you know, and, okay. Um, and she sells wrist lists, which are literally lists written on something that you can clamp on your wrist, of handy words and phrases in the languages of goblins, orcs, elves, dwarves, and many others. She can do all this because she's secretly a kindly brass dragon. What? <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, uh, whose name is Murthy Alex Anthropurar. Uh, what? Um, one more time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not going to even make you spell that one. <laughs> oh, sure, I, I can spell it for you. Okay, yeah, for people writing down at home, just, you know, if you're going to run into a dragon and you want to be polite, uh, <laughs> M-U-R-T-H-I-I-A-L-Y-X-A-N-T-R- T H R O P R A R A. Murthy Alex Anthropera. <laughs> really, really uh, propagating that tradition of, of dragon names I see here. Yeah. Well, uh, which is why she prefers to go by Murthy. I would too. Well, she also prefers to go by Murthy because she doesn't want people to know she's a dragon. <laughs> so, 
She has had quite enough of high-level magical meddling, being cast on the city of Neverwinter and its people, and she will work against anyone, Red Wizards, Aboleths, Servants of Asmodeus, everyone, seeking to do more of it, because she sees Neverwinter as a new hope for cooperation and progress, uh, all the races living in harmony, as opened Miss Draner was first intended to be so long ago, you know, back in the late 200s DR when Elminster visited. Okay, she leans on her draconic mastery of many languages as the basis of her daily business, and she isn't really interested in accumulating wealth. So Mirtha lives her days in human form, revealing herself as a dragon only in emergencies, and she appears as a strikingly beautiful older woman with a streak of white in her styled silver-gray hair and piercing brown eyes. She's of middling height, buxom build, and dresses conservatively in dark, ankle-length gowns with black boots and stomachers. Her sole adornment is dangly earrings from various never-end crafters. Her favorite pair consists of two iron bands of binding. Just in case she runs into problems. This is pure gold. Pure <laughs> gold. I feel like you've knocked it out of the park with the first two, so now I can't wait to hear what the third one is. Well, the first, the third one is, of course, a little more open-ended. <laughs> it, but it's perhaps the most intriguing secret of Neverwinter, and that is how many sentient enchanted items from old spellbooks to magic swords are hidden in the city, how much they are aware of each other, how much they communicate with each other, and what, if any, common agendas they pursue. Without spoiling a major plot point in the D&D movie, a powerful spell was attempted near the end of the film that has big consequences for Neverwinter citizens. And I say, like a professor in a class looking at the ceiling, uh, in any large settlement in the realms, there are local powers that if they like the status quo, may act to defend or try to keep it, if it faces any threat or likelihood of big change. This is as true for Neverwinter as it is for Waterdeep or Baldur's Gate. A fun thread in any realm's campaign that involves Neverwinter could be just which spellbooks, swords, and other intelligent magic items are in the city and how they'll act, both in peacetime and when faced by a threat. Something for Dungeon Masters to think about and play with. Hi kids, and welcome back to Realm Speak. This is the segment where we take a word in the realms, a phrase or a name that you might stumble over it, and we stumble over it for you. This time, we're gonna do this. <laughs> Mount Hotenau. It's not hot enough. It's Hotenau. Hotenau. And this is the volcanic mountain inland from the city of Neverwinter, from which Neverwinter River flows that is warm. It's volcanically warmed. And therefore, despite the fact that Neverwinter is at a northern latitude, it's warmer than it should be because of the volcanic activity deep in Mount Hotanau, which is an active volcano. Hotanau. These are the sort of tales we tell in the realms behind the story that's right in front of you about drag out your swords, kill the dragon, and take the treasure. You know, we're telling these larger stories so that you can make your own mind up in the real world about things that are happening in the real world because we're all about creating better citizens. That's what.